thank God for the ministry of Marcus Pass. Um, um, we thank you all for joining us this Youth Impact Week. There is a word from the Lord this morning. I would like to draw your attention to the book of Habakkuk. We'll be reading from verse 1 through 9 and then looking at verse 17 through 19. It's a long text, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be up here for that long. Um, we're going to move through this um, and see what the Lord has to share with us today. Habakkuk 3, verse 1 through 9, and then 17 through 19. And the word of the Lord reads, A prayer of the prophet Habakkuk according to Shigna. O Lord, I have heard of your renown, and I stand in awe, O Lord, of your work. In our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known. In wrath, may you remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. The brightness was like the sun. Rays came forth from his hand where his power lay hidden. Before him went pestilence and a plague followed close behind him. He stopped and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The eternal mountains were shattered along his ancient pathways. The everlasting hills sank low. I saw the tents of Cushan under affliction. The tent curtains of the land of Midian trembled. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord, or your anger against the rivers, or your rage against the sea? When you drove your horses, your chariots to victory, you brandished your naked bow. Sated were the arrows at your command. Now 17 through 19, though the fig tree does not blossom, and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce, produce of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights to the leader with string instruments. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I would like to speak from this topic. Things will never be the same. Things will never be the same. Join me in prayer. Most holy and righteous God, I do thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will be with us in this moment. I pray, God, that you would um, hide me behind that old rugged, rugged cross, that they would not see Daryl, but they would hear the voice of the Savior, Jesus, calling us all into fellowship, love, and repentance. In no other name but that strong name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Amen. Things will never be the same. The book of Habakkuk is a very fascinating book to me. Though it is only three chapters long, the book has such great uh, dialogue between God and man. The reason why I really like the book of Habakkuk is because the book of Habakkuk starts off very plain and very open. Habakkuk doesn't start off his complaint to God with any kind of, kind of um, pleasantries. He does not say to God, God, most holy and righteous God, most, most awesome God of the universe. He gets straight to the point and he starts off and says, oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? and you will not listen, or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law becomes like, Habakkuk starts off with the question that I think comes to all of our sensibilities. How long? Or as H. Beecher Hicks says, how long the night? How long do we have to go through this situation? I remember when this pandemic 
first began. They said the pandemic will only last, I think, two weeks. And now here we are a year and a half later and everybody's looking at one another and saying, how long? You know, I've, I've, I consider myself a millennial. I am a millennial, right? So in my life, I have seen many things occur in my short life. I remember while being in middle school, when I was in the eighth grade, I was looking out of my window, staring outside of my social studies class on September 11th, and I can see when the second plane flew into the building. And then I saw as the buildings fall down, that was just me being a middle schooler, and I could, at that moment, I was just thinking, how long? I remember in 2008 when the market started to crash and nobody had no money. Money was funny and, and change was strange. And we were wondering in that moment, how long? I remember in my, in my adulthood life, we have been facing with this, with this, this storied question that started off with um, the death of Trayvon Martin up until now. Do black lives really do matter? And we're wondering, how long? And here we are in 2020, in 2021 now, but back in 2020, we encountered a pandemic that brought the economy to its knees, this country to its knees, and the entire world to its knees. And our question has been, how long? We're raising, and this is a generation that has not experienced the grand days of quote unquote America, but now, they're also asking this question, how long? When is my deliverance going to come? When is this madness going to end? How long are we, do we have to be in this situation? We see this in the life of our kids. Because as I talk to more and more young people in this church and outside the church, I see that their lives that is filled with just despair. When they see what is going on in their country, their hearts are filled with despair. We see this as we, throughout this pandemic, despair has also um, affected all of our country because we see the suicide rates are also increasing. We're wondering and people are feeling such despair because they don't know how long do I have to be in this storm? How long do I have to be in this mess? Even as social interactions are decreasing and we're becoming even more isolated, and I fear even after the pandemic, we're still gonna be even more isolated and suspicious of one another, and our question still remains, how long do we have to go through this? Habakkuk, sees the same thing in his ancient world at the same time. That's the question he's asking in chapter one. He says, how long I see the temple is being destroyed? How long we are under oppression by these outside forces? How long do we need and how long are we going to be here? Habakkuk plays it, makes it plain. He doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't try, to, try to make it nice to God. He just says, how long do I have to be here? That's Habakkuk 1. In Habakkuk 2, God says, okay, write the vision now and make it plain. And that's the part that we all sing in, 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 in our churches. Write the vision, make it plain. I would sing it, but then y'all will probably tune out once I start singing it, right? But, 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 but we start, we sing we see, we see it in chapter 2, he says, write the vision and make it plain. And God gives Habakkuk this amazing vision. But now here we are in Habakkuk 3, where I take my text for this morning. And Habakkuk starts it off and he says, O oh Lord, I have heard of your renown, and I stand in awe, O oh Lord, of your work. In the midst of of my years, or as NRSV says, in our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known. In wrath, may you remember mercy. Which brings me to my first point. That how long, how do we deal with this how long moment? First, we have to remember. We have to remember, it's that simple, there ain't nothing crazy here. But the scripture says, oh Lord, I have heard of your renown. Which means, technically, 
that he had to get it from somebody else. He didn't get this on his own. Somebody had to tell him of what God did in the past. He did not, we know scripture says faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. Somebody had to tell Habakkuk the great things of God. And for a generation that finds it hard to see how God is moving in this time, we need more people telling them about the great things that God has done in the past. Now, before you write me off and you just go and tell a young person that, you know, he's been a doctor in the operating room and he's been a lawyer in the courtroom and he's been a bridge over troubled water. He's been, a, a, we, we can go through that whole thing, right? But I believe that this generation wants something a little bit different. Because see, those are nice and cute little platitudes that he's been there, he's been a bridge over troubled water, he's done all these things, but this generation is facing something unique. This generation needs to hear the real story. They need to hear how you were strung out on crack and how God delivered you. They need to hear how you found yourself in some horrible situations and God took you out of it. They don't need the cute church language anymore. They need to hear how God has moved in amazing ways that you were one way but now you're transformed by the blood of Jesus. They need to hear how great God is so that they can also start believing in this God. I position, I, my proposition that may be the reason why we see faith decreasing in our young people is because we have not been vocal, we have not been transparent, we have not told them the truth about how God can really show up in their lives. We have to remember we have to hear what God has did in the past and what God is going to do in the future. So we remember, but also in this text, he makes a turn. He says, now God, I heard of what you did. And God, quite frankly, God, that was cute. That was nice. That was great what you did in the past. But he then pushes it a little further. And he says, in our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known. In wrath, may you remember mercy. See, a lot of times in our church and in our lives, we make a, there's a, I first want to say there's a difference between reliving and remembering the past. Because see, there's a lot of people who can tell you about the past but they want to make the past the present. They want to make the, what they experienced in the past and how God moved in the past into the present. And we try to relive what happened in the past. We hear it all the time. I remember when this church used to be filled with so many people. I remember when everybody prayed in schools. I remember, and they, and they make the, the judgment that because we're not doing that, that means God is not moving right now. But I'm here to tell somebody that God is moving in the present. God, as Habakkuk said, in our own time, in our own way, I need God to show up right now. We want God to revive what is going on here. This goes a little further. And what bogged my mind as I read this text is really in verse 3. Because the scripture says, God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now you at home should be running around your house at that verse. You should be losing your mind at that verse because that verse tells everything about what God is going to do. If you understand ancient Judaism at the time, the center of faith was Jerusalem. So if God was going to come from anywhere, God will be coming from Jerusalem. The, another amazing point, another amazing part of Israel, you probably would have said, God is coming from Mount Sinai. That would have been great as well. But in this text, Habakkuk, in his vision, he said, God came from Taman, and the Holy One came from Mount Paran which means that God is now moving in a way that he's not moving before. 
while we're looking and keeping our eyes on Jerusalem and keeping our eyes centered around Mount Sinai, God is doing a new thing and coming out of Edom and God is coming from many different places than where we expected God to come from now. See, many of the times we have our focus on how God used to move, that we miss what God is doing right now in this season. Because we're so focused on what he used to do that we can't appreciate what God is doing now. So maybe God is not going to speak through choirs anymore. Maybe he's going to speak through through praise teams, God is doing a new thing. Maybe God is not going to speak by us coming together and, and filling this whole place, but we are. God is still speaking to us as we sit in our living room. God is doing a new thing. And if you stay, keep your eyes on Jerusalem, if you keep your eyes on Mount Sinai, you're going to miss the move of God in this season and in this generation as long as you keep your eyes on off of um, Jerusalem and off of Mount Sinai. God came from Taman, and the Holy One came from Mount Paran. That's good news for us. And then we see in this text how God showed up. He showed up because his glory started covering the heavens. And he showed up because the earth started to shake and he showed up because injustice started to bend and he showed up because the nations started to get trembled at his voice god was showing up in a way that he never showed up before but we have to be careful because god doesn't show up the way we want god to show up we want God to put everything a lot of times into a nice, clean bowl and present it to us. We want God to show up in the ways that we have, um, those of us who went to seminary have studied and said God moves in this particular way. We want God to show up in, in the ways that he showed up to our ancestors. We want God to show up in the way he showed up in the 60s and in the 70s and in the 80s and in the 90s and in the 10s and even the 2010s. We want God to show up in those ways because that's familiar. But when God shows up, he always gives us something new for this time, right? So that brings me to verse 17. And when reading this text, I got really excited because the Bible says we just read through a few verses, actually a lot of verses, and I, and I actually skipped some verses. But God shows up, and then in verse 17, it says, the fig tree does not blossom. God shows up, and there's no fruit on the vine still. God shows up, and there's no produce of the olive. God shows up and the field yield no food. God shows up and the flock is cut off from the fold. God shows up and there's no herd in the stalls. God showed up in all these powerful ways. And yet, the fig tree is not blossoming. The fruit is on the vine. No produce of the olive. No grain in the field, which means God showed up and you don't got no bread. God showed up and you don't got no watermelon. God showed up and you don't got no fried chicken. God showed up and everything around you is still going to hell. God shows up and everything is different. But verse 18 says, even if God doesn't show up in those ways, verse 18 says, yet I will rejoice. In the Lord. I would exult in the God of my salvation, which says that if God doesn't move the way I want God to move, I'm still going to rejoice. Now that's some bold faith. That's some crazy faith to say, I know my bread ain't coming. My money is getting kind of funny. My change, my change is getting a little bit strange, but yet I still rejoice in God. That no matter my circumstance, that's not going to dictate my praise. No matter what is going to me, going on on the outside of me, I'm still going to worship God, even if God doesn't show up in the way that I want him to show up. 
yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And this made me think of a time uh, when I was around 12 years old. When I was 12, I had the opportunity to, my parents took me on a cruise. And while we were on this cruise, I was excited to go to the ports of call. I was excited to go to, I think it was Grand Cayman and Mexico and uh, Belize, Honduras. I was so excited about this. But my parents, while on the trip, they were excited about something else. They got word that f at the nighttime, they always did like a show at nighttime. At nighttime, the presenter for this show was Jimmy Walker. I didn't say Johnny Walker, Saints. I said Jimmy Walker, right? Um, my parents are Pentecostal. They don't know who Johnny Walker is, right? Jimmy Walker. Jimmy Walker, for the, for the younger saints out here, is a star of this show called Good Times. He had a name called JJ. And I felt sorry for Jimmy Walker while he was on this cruise, because people just walk up to him all day, all night, and go, dynamite, just all, all day, all night. He's trying to eat breakfast, and they're just like, dynamite. And after a while, <laughs> I could tell he was not too happy, right? But my parents were excited about this guy named Jimmy Walker. And we went on, the, went on this cruise. Every night they went to his show. They came out laughing. They came out enjoying it. I'm a 12-year-old. I don't know what good times is. I'm like, this is some old people stuff, whatever. When I got back home, they used to have a, a, a station called TV Land in which they showed like all the old shows. One day I decided to go and watch it so happened, it was Sanford and Son one time, and the next time was Good Times. And after watching Good Times, I started falling in love with, well, my first crush was Thelma at that point, right? I started falling in love with Thelma, right? And you had um, Florida, you had Miss Evans, and you had Michael, um, and, and, and you had Buffalo Butt Book, Bookman, right? Those older saints know exactly who I'm talking about. This is JJ and JJ from the good times. But the one thing about this show that always bugged my mind was that this was a, a, a people who were living in these projects of Chicago, and yet the name of the show was called Good Times. They had hell and trauma all around. There was an episode, for those, I'm gonna spoil it, spoiler alert, that um, the father, he dies, but they still named the show good times. And what really bugged me out about this was the song of good times. Because this is what it says. It says, anytime you meet a payment, that's good times. Anytime you need a friend, good times. Anytime you're out from under, good times. Not getting hassled, not getting hustled, keeping your head above water, making a wave when you can, but then it goes a little further now. It says temporary layoffs, good times. Easy credit ripoffs, good times. Scratching and surviving, good times. Hanging in and jiving, good times. Ain't we lucky we've got them, good times. That even though the hell they were facing with inside of this apartment building, they still had the audacity to say that I'm still having good times. That is what this text is saying to us. It's as though the fig tree does not blossom, and there's no fig on the vine, and though all hell is breaking loose all around me, I'm so glad this morning I can still rejoice in the Lord, for the God is still the God of my salvation. So no matter what I'm going through, it is still good times. But there was another time that goes back 2,000 years ago, that which they said, many people said it would have been bad times. But 
the Bible says that they hung him high and that's some good times. They stretched him wide and that's some good times. They, he bowed his head and that's some good times. And for me and you, he died and that's some good times. But that's not how the story ends. That's some good times. Three days later, he rose again with all dynamite power. That's some good times. I'm so glad this morning that things will never be the same. But one thing I do know, my praise is going to go to another level. So the text says, we're going to keep this pushing a little bit. So the text says, even though all hell is breaking loose around me, I will still rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Which suggests to me this morning that even though all hell is breaking loose around me, even though there's a pandemic all around me, even though there's still fights for racial justice around me, even though black boys and black girls are still being shot and killed all around me, even though the trauma and everything is all around me, the Bible says, I will still rejoice because though everything around me is going crazy, I know in this text it says, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. You should start jumping and shouting in that moment. And he makes me tread upon the heights, which suggests to me that even though my situation may not get better, I know that I'm getting better. And I wonder if there's anybody here today that will say without a shadow of doubt that I know this pandemic has taken 600,000 lives, but through this pandemic, I'm getting better. Through this pandemic, I'm getting wiser. Through this pandemic, things are changing for my good. I know everything is not good, but thanks be to God that things are getting better, but I'm getting better. I'm treading. My God has made me, has given me strength to tread upon the heights. I'm getting better. Things may not get better, but I am better. 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 The Lord is my strength. And he makes my feet like the feet of the deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Church, things are not going to be the same. Even when we regather, things are not going to be the same. But one thing that doesn't change in here is that God does not change. God is still talking God is still using his people even in these times. So I would like to offer you this morning, this Christ, this Savior, this Lord, who still speaks to us right now, that though everything around you may not be looking better, God desires to make you better. God doesn't desire for you to leave this time without becoming better. So if you want to know a little bit more about this Jesus, if you want to know a little bit more about this Christ, you can call us right now. There's ministers waiting on the phone for you right now. Call us at 703-920-7293 if you desire to be part of the family of God. And if you also desire to be a member here at the Mount Olive Baptist Church, we'll be happy to receive you. Now is the time, now is the time to make that decision because things are not going to ever be the same.
good. You've been so good. Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. 